so thanks for taking the time out. Um, we didn't have one of these workshops last month. Uh, it was pretty busy, I think, for everyone. Community footy finally got started back in Vic, which was huge, huge breakthrough for everyone. And I'm sure you've all been swamped with many uh, scheduling uh, appointment issues and problems and spanners in the work. So thanks for taking the time out and we'll try and keep this to as close as an hour as possible. Uh, before we get started, so I thought I did have the I did have a welcome to country. Um, so before we do get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are gathered on today, a land on which we play our great game of Australian football. I acknowledge elders both past, present and emerging and pay our respects to the Aboriginal connection to land, sea and spirit. I do apologise that that slide is not appearing. Uh, there's the agenda, so we'll try and we won't go through in complete order. Uh, I'm going to jumble a couple of things up, but um, sent that out uh, on Monday. What I am going to do straight away, I'm going to jump forward to the female mentorship program. Uh, and I'm going to get Al to kick us off. I know she's at school and I hope uh, she's not going to get called away, so we'll get her to kick off, kick us off. Thank you, Tabo. Yeah, hopefully I'm in a meeting room that I haven't booked, so I'm hoping no one kind of pops in and kicks me out. But um, thanks for your time today. I just wanted to quickly just touch base and just let you know that we've had a few sessions of the female mentorship program uh, underway in the last, I guess, couple months. Basically, we're meeting as a, a group um, basically every third Sunday of the month to kind of come together to have a few guest speakers and basically have an opportunity to chat um, about different things, challenges or successes. We've actually had um, a few girls in our group uh, in the past few weeks have actually been appointed to senior matches so it was really nice to actually see the girls to come together and be really um, excited for each other and obviously you know celebrating little successes which is part of what our group is for so i want to just touch base and just let you know that that's all happening behind the scenes we had have had um, samantha may dr samantha may who's a um the vfl umpires doctor this year so she chatted to us in our first session uh, basically about female health um, and that's almost like that's a bit of a theme I guess going forward in terms of our umpiring groups, um, but also our, our group in particular, that we haven't really had many chances to talk about female health before. It hasn't, we haven't really had the number of girls to actually warrant that. So we're kind of going through a stage now where we're starting to talk about, I guess, how females are different from males um, and obviously what that, that looks like in terms of um, training facilities and just different things like that as well. So Samantha May was excellent and she answered some really, um, you know, unique questions, which was really fantastic. Um, coming up, we've also got um, Nicole Livingston as our, one of our guest speakers next, and that'll be really great, obviously, to hear about her journey in terms of her own career pathway in elite sport, and then obviously administration and in terms of her media stuff as well. So really exciting to have her on board in terms of presenting to our group. Um, that's the female, female mentorship stuff. It's been going really well um, overall. If you do have girls at your uh, community that are involved in the Talent Academy and perhaps um, haven't taken up the opportunity to be part of that group yet, um, please just let them know. You're a really welcoming group. We really um, celebrate each other's successes and, and support each other. And that's that's primarily what that group is for. And so I would encourage you to, to just check in with them to see how it's going. The other thing I want to really just briefly mention is that for the first time, we're going to have a national uh, female umpire coaches network workshop that's going to be coming up um, toward the end of May. So basically similar to what we do in these sessions in our micro workshops run by Chelsea, we're going to have a couple um, national group sessions with all of the female umpire coaches um, around Australia. So that'll be a really great opportunity for, you know, it is um, fewer women, obviously, in coaching roles. than obviously traditionally a very male orientated, um, I guess, um, practice. Um, so we're going to have all those females come together and actually do a couple workshops where Chelsea will run some inclusion components to it. But again, mainly just to have that opportunity to network and have some support and just discuss different challenges they might be facing in their different regions across Australia and perhaps some of their really great and unique strategies that have helped to boost um, not only female umpiring numbers, but also just people from diverse backgrounds. So really the purpose in that is to network but also to figure out what are some strategies that we're using across Australia that are working really well that we can hopefully implement into other different regional and metro communities. So really excited that's coming up. Um, the last little point I'll make is just for our schools, umbrella course um, well underway. We're into term two in um, Victorian schools at the moment. And I just want to have a bit of a shout out to, um, we've got some, some fantastic results from that school course this year. We've had 
um, in the past couple of weeks, I've seen results come back that have had eight or nine uh, students from each class kind of actually saying, yes, they'd like to be contacted about umpiring. So, you know, eight or nine people out of 28 is a really significant portion. And if we can get, you know, four or five of them into training, that's, you know, probably minimal work for us. Um, and then we obviously get maximal return. So I would encourage you to continue to, I guess, assist with those workshops being facilitated. And it is really important if you can, or one of your representatives can get to that last session, it makes a really big difference in terms of spruiking your umpiring club and giving that familiar face when that person then does come out to your umpiring training session for the first time. So um, thanks to all of you for supporting that program so far. It's been a really great take up, both from the schools and from you guys. And so hopefully we can continue to see some really great results, which obviously encourages us all to keep going and to kind of really use that program to, I guess, build and maximise our umpiring numbers. Do you guys have any questions <coughs> with me about female mentorship program, the, the coaches network or um, the schools program just while I'm here? Uh, Ando, Ando's written a, uh, a question for you, for everyone else. So um, how many female umpire coaches do you expect in those sessions? So we've invited 40, about about 40 coaches um, nationally. Now, we've also emailed out um, all the different state league coaches just because there's probably a few people who aren't um, registered as, as they kind of should be at the moment. So I think we're hoping to invite around 40, maybe fact shifting maximum. Um, and obviously hoping to get as many of them if possible. So we've, we've put that um, date out quite early to make sure everyone kind of brings themselves up to attend. But it should be a really great opportunity for, um, you know, some of the, the women in your leagues have already um, obviously been invited and accepted. And so it should be a great opportunity to, to come together and I guess firstly network, but also see what are some strategies we're using that we can take into other communities. I think just on that, Al, I, for those that are online and those who are listening now, um, I did email a probably a couple of months ago about if you had any female coaches that you'd like to get involved. If you haven't responded and you've got some female coaches, please send me their details. I'll pass them on to Al. So um, Al can include those people in any correspondence that's getting sent out. Cool. Thanks guys for your time. And if you do have questions about female mentorship program, the coaching uh, network or the schools program, please don't hesitate to contact me because we want these programs to be as successful as possible and, and your input is really valuable in that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Al. OK, so we're going to go back to this start now. Um, so just community umpiring week, just a bit of a recap. Um, so we had four activations um, over the course of the last two weeks. We had AFL umpires attending community umpire training. Community umpires were led, led the AFL umpire panel onto the ground at AFL matches across the country, except for in WA, unfortunately. Uh, community umpires also participated in all the Auskick games at half time at those games. And then we also had nine AFL umpires return to community football to umpire a junior match with a community umpire. Um, for activations, the, the feedback that's come back has been extremely positive. Uh, I've just got some snapshots here of just some of the the, the different things that happened around, around Victoria in particular. So umpire training, umpires out on the G, um, we had some excellent AFL photographers take some photos and we've passed those on to uh, all the umpires that were involved. And then we had the AFL ups, obviously, at a, at a at back at grassroots level. And we had a couple of um, special guests uh, down in SMJFL where Jack Billings took on the goals in one game. And we also had Nick Vloston and Brody Grundy at a Yarra Junior match um, also in the goals. Um, and here is just some feedback that I received from some of the umpires in particular, um, just expressing how much they really enjoyed their experiences. Um, all the feedback's been positive. I do know that this year, there are probably some umpire clubs that probably didn't get as much uh, involvement as they would have hoped or have compared to in previous years. And unfortunately, we had to keep pretty much all the other AFL umpires in their own locality in terms of where they lived or where they worked. So we were quite restricted in where we could send them uh, this year. So we do acknowledge that some umpire clubs probably didn't get as much um, engagement as they probably have in the past. But um, besides that, is there any immediate feedback from anyone now about that week? Um, any communication that could have gone out a bit better or is there anything that was done differently that you really like that we'd like to push forward for, for future years? No, also I'll take that as all positive still. So 
Yeah, everything was really positive. The me- AFL media did an excellent job at supporting the week as well, um, getting the commentators to mention it and uh, during broadcasting. Uh, it was mentioned on radio a couple of times, had a couple of news articles um, throughout the week. So, um, and to everyone that sort of pushed out all the comms and all the all the engagement piece, um, the stakeholder kit that was sent out to your your leagues or your commissions or your your, your media personnel. Um, thanks very much uh, for doing that. It's really started to hopefully normalise umpiring a little bit more. And that's what we're we're aiming to do with all these all these little programs we're pushing forward. Uh, the Talent Academy, uh, just a bit of an update. Um, firstly, on the um, the PD side, so our next online session is on the 26th of May. Uh, so we've got a, a topic called what's in officiating. Um, I've locked in an AFL umpire, uh, a Cricket Australia umpire, a A-League umpire. I'm hoping to also lock in a Suncorp Super Netball umpire and also a rugby union referee. It'll be a little bit of an online interview. I've already asked all the academy umpires to suggest and submit some potential questions that can be asked for them to learn about the differences and similarities across different sporting codes in umpiring. Uh, So that is well um, underway in preparation. So it'll be 26th of May. So please make sure you remind your uh, Academy umpires about that. If you do have training on the Wednesday, uh, please, if possible, let them off the track early so they can participate. Um, it will be hopefully a really engaging and informative session for everyone involved. Um, what we've had so far, and this is what I'll talk about a little bit, uh, so state league appointments. Now, I know earlier in the year we were pushing for a potential three-week contract and um, with a small COVID outbreak uh, early in the NAB girls and VFLW season, that kind of put a span in the works um, as there were additional games that weren't originally fixtured um, later in the season uh, that had to be re- that had to be played later on. So um, the state league requirements in terms of umpire appointments grew dramatically quite quickly and earlier than expected, which meant that three week contract never eventuate, eventuated. Uh, and academy umpires were asked to fill in for state league games earlier than we anticipated. Um, through that process, there were 70 appointments across the three disciplines, the so 23 field, 37 boundary, 10 goal. Um, most of the feedback that's been received from the, the state league coach has been extremely positive, and I know um, most, I, I believe most field umpires received some feedback um, from Tony Hales, so he is all over over this program. Um, we do have another small um, small period of maybe two to three weeks where there is again an influx of games where there are interstate teams for the NAB League coming down to Victoria to play. Um, so that's starting the weekend of May twenty second, twenty third. I've already contacted any umpire managers that are that may be involved in that that weekend but uh, just a heads up that there's a couple of weeks coming up where there might be some influx of umpires Um, I know it hasn't quite gone to plan how it was originally put forward and unfortunately that was just out of our control and and even now fixtures aren't quite being confirmed until the week of their games so I know there's a NAB league intensity fixture at the moment um, but that's changing um, week to week and the VFL fixture is not um, not being released until two weeks prior, which making it really hard to know how many senior umpires across the disciplines are actually required um, at different points within the weekend. So um, thank you for everyone that's that's um, been really flexible and allowed the academy umpires to get these opportunities. Um, it's definitely allowing them to put their best foot forward in terms of you know future selection and whatnot. So a few more weeks of that. Um, and hopefully then uh, your academy umpires will be solely ready, um, ready for community. I have asked all the development um, uh, coaches to select specific Sunday games rather than any any just random games across the weekend, only Sundays. There might may be a couple of Saturdays just depending on availability, um, but mainly Sunday so it's not interfering with your senior competitions. Um, are there any questions 
about the academy umpires being involved in the state league program at the moment? No, awesome. Uh, it, just in terms of the pay, uh, I know I've had a lot of questions. I've sent a couple of emails and I'll try and clear it up again here. So um, state league payments. So um, the state league will wait until all academy appointments have been completed um, and then uh, we'll just we'll send through basically the total amount of all the appointments from your from your umpires out for you to invoice to the state league. NAB championships that's changed a little bit. Um, I've already sent off to the, the uh, talent department uh, the total cost of umpires for each umpire club that was involved. Uh, I'm hoping uh, I've sent that off a couple of weeks ago. I've chased it up a couple of times. I'm hoping that they'll come back uh, with their requirements very shortly on how to invoice. And just to explain that, so now um, I know in the past invoices just been sent to the relevant department. They've just been paid. Um, now any payments by the AFL have to be pre-approved before um, they receive an invoice, which is a bit frustrating. Um, we have to generate a purchase order, um, which I know most government entities do already. Um, and it's just a, a new process that we have to follow and a lot of people have to get used to something that's changing a little bit. So I do apologise it's taken longer than, than previous years. Uh, it is a little bit more complex, but um, we are starting to get used to and the system behind the scenes is now starting to be understood on what's required. So we will get there eventually. I do apologise for the delays. Uh, the Community Umpire Club Improvement Plan. This is just a quick little reminder um, on your dashboard. Um, please just fill in the checklist um, for your CUCIP. Ando has removed the requirement to include evidence as that's an, an end of season uh, requirement so we can help you for the following season. But uh, if you can all start to just fill in that checklist on where you feel you're going really well, where you need to assist, where you need some assistance, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Umpire coach accreditation. Uh, Ando, I know you're there, but are you able to talk and just give a quick update on the online component? Yeah, thanks, Talbo. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for your time. Just an update on umpire coach accreditation. Um, we're behind schedule on that, but um, it has actually been loaded up into the LMS, just doing some final checks and balances. So as of as of next week, we'll get Talbo to, to, to send you through follow-up email. That'll be open to all the umpire coaches to jump on and do their either development umpire coach accreditation course or advanced umpire coach course about an hour max 45 minutes um and then we'll be able to book in some consolidation workshop virtual consolidation workshops um with them post that so yeah very that's a very brief update on that one live next week and some workshops um in kind of the following following month after that Thanks, Ando. Yeah, we and we do apologise for the delay. It's you know the the uh, so Josh Atwood who's doing that behind the scenes. He's just been flooded. Yeah, he's a sole sole worker with, with many different portfolios at the moment. So he's trying to juggle many different uh, many different tasks. Um, uh, and uh, we had a, I had a chat to, I had a ch chat to Josh Josh yesterday. Um, it is very close. We just need to do some final checks. So hopefully we will get that live um, next week for everyone, and we'll send out all the details. Um, just as a bit of a reminder on the process, um, so we've got the new the new sort of uh, level. So we've got the intro and then the development and the advanced. The intro is the match day coach, which you just need the com competency checklist. Um, I've thrown in the matrices on who can assess and tick off on who. So for umpires, which umpire coaches can tick off on their accreditation. Um, for an umpire coach, which umpire you can tick off, and then if you're an umpire coach, which other coaches you can tick off. So I'll email all these through individually as well. Um, I'll include those and also the coaching competency checklist. So uh, this is what you'll need to, or one of your 
um, accredited coaches will need to fill out for other coaches who are completing their accreditation. Um, that'll need to be filled out once they've done their online portion. And again, um, thank you for all those who have already done it, but uh, if you have umpire coaches who are still not coming up on FootyWeb as an umpire coach, uh, a little, uh, I think it's about 40 seconds video on how to change them to an umpire coach on FootyWeb, so that way we can um, we can gather some data on how many uh, umpire coaches we have in the state. Any questions on accreditation? No, awesome. Okay, uh, NAB, Auskick, and communication. So uh, this will be pretty quick. So firstly, Auskick, um, can we please just make sure that the Auskick umpires that you've sent through to me actually are aware of what they are being nominated for and what they need to do. I've had quite a few of these umpires uh, um, decline their appointments, <laughs> which is making it very hard some weeks to to get Auskick umpires. Um, uh, some of them I've, I've never heard from. Uh, they're not replying to emails or they're confirming or declining their appointment a couple of days out from their game, um, trying to get them to respond to text messages uh, it's just being really hard. So if you've got um, some, umpire, some umpires who have been nominated for Oscar, can you please just remind them? Um, they need to be available from Friday to Sunday. They'll find out two weeks in advance. They may be named as an emergency, and if they are, then they, you know, hopefully they try to keep themselves available. Um, and they need to confirm the Tuesday before their match. Um, most of them are coming back to me after the fact with either a reason why they can't umpire or they're confirming really, really late, which is making ticketing quite difficult. So please just give them a bit of a, a heads up uh, on what they what's required of them. And then uh, in terms of communication for, for me with you guys, um, I've just got the traditional model here uh, where we've got uh, Ando as the national community umpire manager will push out information to all the state uh, representatives. So that'll be either myself, Al or Chelsea um, in Vic. We then push on relevant info to you guys. So the Metro umpire managers, RAC directors of umpiring, or um, for those that for those commissions that don't have a director of umpiring, the umpire association contacts. Uh, and then from there, the information gets pushed on to the relevant uh, footy ops CEOs, RMs, uh, relevant people within your leagues or commissions, or your umpire coaches or any other stakeholders that you have. Um, I know there's not many of you online now, uh, so if there's any immediate feedback on this, I would love to hear it. Or if there's anyone that's listening, if you've got any feedback on this, please let me know. Basically, I just want to put it to you um, whether you think this model is still the way to go or if there needs to be a bit of a change. Um, I only ask because I'm finding, especially now that footy has started at community level, I'm getting a lot of emails and also phone calls from random umpires and some uh, people who claim that they're umpire coaches that I'm not aware of asking about law information and rules. Uh, and, it, and it's information that I've pushed on to everyone here and, and other people. Uh, and I'm also you know, just trying to, I guess, streamline any information that comes, goes to academy umpires in terms of appointments, um, getting information out to uh, CEOs. AFL Vic have asked me to share some information. Uh, the CEOs have given me some feedback about that information, um, which hasn't been too positive, to be to be honest. Um, and there's just some other, like the Auskick umpires as well. They're not getting back to me. So if there's any immediate feedback now on this model, is is this something that needs to be changed or does it work well? Any thoughts from anyone here? No, nothing. Look, if anyone can think of anything and they think a process can be improved, please let me know. Uh, I know this is a traditional model where it's probably what happened uh, prior to COVID with, with Russ uh, and, and the group, and that's fine, and that's just how I've adopted it. But if, if you think that something can be um, improved, please let me know. I'm always looking to 
make life easier for for everyone involved. So if I can do something a bit differently, it's going to make life easier for us all. Please do let me know. Uh, junior club engagement, I'm just going to um, highlight this one again. We are getting some excellent traction in terms of community football clubs uh, jumping on board with umpiring achievements and events. So here is just a few examples of uh, umpires or umpiring groups and football clubs being connected um, online. Uh, and this is where football clubs have probably their biggest presence in terms of people that be able to view. And we've got um, uh, football clubs sharing uh, umpiring content. We've got football clubs commenting on football content about individual umpires. We've got football clubs promoting their own players slash umpires about their achievements. Um, so these are just some simple things that um, we can all start to do now to try and build that, that junior club engagement piece. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone else saw it, but there was a really good article about the Ocean Grove Cobras, which obviously Jock has um, started up this year. Um, and I heard through a podcast as well. I tried to kick it off last year as well. Um, Jock, I know I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, still on the YouTube link, sorry. Oh, it's working. You've got it, Ando? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, Jock, I'm just going to ask very quickly, um, can you, I guess, just give a quick little explanation or tell us how successful or any challenges you've had with Ocean Grove um, now that it's up and running? Uh, Jock is not able to chat right now. Sorry, Jock, you might have to leave and jump back in, um, but we'll keep pushing on. Sorry about that, Jock. Uh, and just so I guess, the junior club engagement program, just to reiterate. Um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of messages at the moment. OK. Um, so junior club engagement. Sorry, and um, oh, there we go. Now. Glad to reload it all. All good. Uh, yeah, can you give us just a, a bit of a overview of how it's all gone so far yeah it's going really well I've got 21 kids uh, involved uh, pretty much colandina roster them to all their modified rules games also other clubs have asked whether they could use the kids as well so they're being shared out to other clubs in that space as well there's obviously too many kids and not enough games so the other clubs are taking on board uh, i've got two other clubs i've visited that want to run a similar program and uh, and having a soft start uh, in the second half of the season so um the, the transition to to league umpiring has been offered as far as boundary umpiring goes because the field umpiring would clash with their playing commitments um and there's some interest but i think the transition will be more for next year and we'll see the real growth out of this over the next two years but 21 21 kids involved we've got about uh, 10 at newcomb um, Talker, you're interested. So they're, they're, it's gaining some momentum because this has taken off so well. So it's pretty much club run. Um, we'll visit every four or five weeks, uh, help run a session, do what we need to do, but it's pretty much driven by the club and financed by the club as well. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jock. And that's, that's, um, that's pretty much junior club engagement in a nutshell, um, engaging your clubs to you know, promote umpiring within their club, 
the money goes back into their umpires. And I know Ocean Grove are you, doing it a little bit different where they're actually funding the payment to do their modified rules. No issue at all with their, their that's that's how they're um, promoting their umpires. <clears throat> so on the, on the back of that, again, hopefully there's a four very simple steps um, to help anyone else do the same thing with one of their clubs to start off with, engage the club, promoting umpiring to uh, the club committee and each of the teams that are 13 and over, um, educating though, those player umpires, so visiting training. And again, like Jock said, every four or five weeks, it doesn't have to be every single week, it's just every four or five weeks, get some senior umpires or some of your more senior junior umpires to go out and get them to get some experience doing some coaching. Um, so going out and educating those player umpires you have the club just promote um, those umpires on social media, promoting their achievements. Um, even though it's promoting umpiring, it's promoting their club as well. So it works both ways there. And at the end of the year, have the club celebrate their player umpires with their achievements at the end of the year. So they're normalising umpiring into their own club. People are starting to <coughs> recognise their players that are also umpiring as well. And the long term effect is it changes that match day environment because umpires are going to be from their own club and you're not going to have parents and, 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 and other officials, you know, abusing and, and being untowards umpires when they know that it's going to be from their club or if they know it's from the opposition club where a parent might be an earshot, they're, uh, they're generally not going to behave in that manner. Um, four simple steps. If you want any help, please reach out. I am working with a couple other groups to help start up this, this program this year with some football clubs, so please reach out if you do want assistance. We can also put you in touch with Carl Fletcher, who was the brainchild of all this up in New South Wales and brought it down to AFL Southeast. Um, just while we were waiting for Jock to reload, um, Ando has just confirmed, so uh, Community Umpiring Week, uh, just going back a little bit, in 2019, there were 62 registrations during the week. Uh, 2020, 203 registrations. So um, that's that's the influence that Community Umpiring Week have. Now, 203 isn't going to solve all the all the media hype that goes behind umpiring, but um, it is starting to make a dent in um, the broader picture of umpiring in, in the community. Um, last thing, just on junior club engagement, what I will be doing is I'm going to send you out uh, this document. It might be a bit small to see um, all the information, but basically it's a list of all the Victorian VFL field umpires, <clears throat> what umpire club they came from, and then also what junior football club they came from. So if you see anything with any of the VFL umpires this year uh, that have been promoted by the VFUA or um, umpire AFL or anywhere else, Feel free to tag in their umpire, your umpire club, but also tag in their junior club to, I guess, start that relationship building between you and the clubs. Um, I, I did one for Marty Roger when he was appointed to the AFLW. <coughs> AFL, uh, sorry, when he uh, achieved 50 VFL games and Montmorency Football Club jumped on board that and shared it and commented. So um, just a small little step to help build um, that junior club engagement piece. Any questions just before we move on to the last last part of this workshop? No, awesome. Okay, uh, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Chelsea, who's going to do our next um, our next micro series workshop on inclusion. Uh, I'm just going to make you a presenter, Charles, and then you shouldn't have any issues with sharing your screen. Beautiful. Just waiting for that to plop up there. Okay, so you should be able to share your screen now. Give it a go. Um, and I'm just going to keep the recording going. Yes, yeah, uh, sounds Don't worry about re-recording. Um, just that, that way, everyone, it's all in one. Sounds perfect. Can you just confirm to me that um, you have got just the slide there, says do words matter? Um, perfect. 
I can see the whole thing. Your notes, yes. I will uh, get out of there and try again. Present a view. How's that? Uh, no, so you can see the so whole thing. To, just go to normal slideshow. Yeah, no, I like my. Sorry, everyone. We'll uh, sort this out in just a moment. Um, usually, when I share, I've just got the um, presentation up there because I wouldn't mind my notes. That's all. I'll just Can try you again. Go back into your PowerPoint. Yeah. If you click on just just your normal presentation, and then you can click present a view on your screen. So I'll just go end show, slideshow. Yep. Present a view. No, no, no. Do the do the just the normal one. So from beginning. But then, how do I get my presenter screen? I don't know why it's not working today. So on yours, <laughs> yeah. uh, there should be some dots somewhere where you can yep. change to pre present a view on your screen only. How's that? You've still just got the slide up there? No, we can't see anything now. Oh. Nothing. You got to so share. You got nothing. No, we can't share. You haven't shared your screen. I'll share again. Hey guys, uh, yeah, I'm really tech savvy. How's that? Now do that, and I'll go back to the original. How's that? Yeah, so you still got your notes. Yeah, I don't know why today it's doing it. I don't know why. <laughs> um, give me a second. Uh, well, I'll just go from. On, if you yeah. just click on use use slideshow. No, no, don't click on just, yeah. And so just can do you that. see your notes? No, I can't. Oh, can't. <laughs> I don't know what it's working. So that's all right. I'll just, uh, I'll just wing it. How about that? It's all yours. We'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. Hey, sorry for that, everyone. It's really nice to uh, to catch up with you all. I hope everyone's been well. Um, really positive stuff with um, Community Umpiring Week. Uh, it was really, really pleasing to see that the amount of coverage that we got. Um, just, yeah, fantastic to see the support from from media and, and community clubs getting around each other and, and promoting umpiring. So always nice to have positive stories. Um, look, today's micro series workshop is on inclusive language. And I just want to talk about the impact and legacy of our language because I think often, you know, we, we throw around the idea of inclusive language, but how often do we stop and reflect on what it actually means? So today is all about covering off those principles. So the obvious question, do words actually matter? <laughs> do they actually have an impact? And I've consulted one of the, the best of the best here in Phil Jackson, who of course we know from the Chicago Bulls and LA Lakers fame as a, as a coach. Um, one of the best in the business and just a couple of key quotes that he shares in um, in 11 Rings, which is one of his books. And he says, early in the season, the players had created a chant. They would shout before each game, their hands joined together in a circle. One, two, three, ring. Okay, so obviously very simple chant that the players would have. The words themselves were only talking about four words, but they had a very significant influence on what the players were thinking. It was used to align um, the strategy for the team uh, and get everyone in the mind, in the zone for, for taking on the game. Another quote there, Kobe and Fish kicked off the first day of training camp with a speech about how the upcoming season would be a marathon, not a sprint, how we needed to focus on meeting force with force and not allowing ourselves to be intimidated by physical pressure. And you look at some of those words, pressure, intimidation, force. Um, and ultimately, I think you look at that quote and go, well, there's a very clear message being sent through through these words. Uh, and that is firstly, the, the players themselves has ta have taken on the leadership mantle. It's not the coach addressing the team at the start of the year. It's the players sending a very clear message through language, communicating their meaning um, and just the significance of doing that at the start of the year. And getting everyone on board for the for the same messaging. Of course, we all know the story of Jackson's relationship with uh, one of the outliers you might regard from the team um, in Dennis Rodman, and and the very famous relationship that they had, and, and Phil's ability to actually connect with him uh, through communicating, through speaking a language that Rodman really understood one on one. And what I found really interesting was was learning about the story of, of um, how often, you know, the media scrum would descend and and talk about how the team must be affected by Rodman's antics. Um, Phil Jackson, in the way that he managed that situation through his language, through his communication, uh, was very clear in, in not buying into it. 
and it was very clear in in what the team needed to hear, what the public needed to hear, in saying, no, look, we're fine. We've we've got a strategy and a way of communicating and implementing that strategy, and um, we're not going to buy into it. And so that was done very effectively uh, through. Phil Jackson's communication and the way that he addressed both the media, the public and the team. I want to touch briefly on the meaning of language. Um, and of course, you know, you, you look at different languages uh, across the world. Now, if you say the plate broke in Spanish, um, that's an accidental way of, of saying it. So if you were to say in Spanish, he broke the plate, that actually apportions blame. So um, if someone's, you know, accidentally broken something, you would use the appropriate sentence structure to describe that. Um, without actually, you know, literally describing that concept of blame. Um, of course, in English, we might say it completely differently. He broke the plate. Doesn't mean it's anyone's fault. Doesn't mean it was intentional. Um, but it's just a sentence and, and the way that we structure our words. So it starts to take on a bit more meaning when you when you look at things like um, being in a courtroom, uh, you know, apportioning blame if someone's been accused of something quite serious, for example. Language actually matters. So, you know, language matters in how we, we describe things. So in other languages, um, often nouns or objects will be ascribed with feminine or masculine characteristics. So if, you know, you're speaking in German, uh, where bridge is a feminine word, you might describe it as being elegant and beautiful. In Spanish, bridge is actually masculine. And so it might be described as strong and imposing. And of course, in English, it's not so common to attribute um, words with masculine or feminine traits, but we definitely have masculine and feminine language that we might ascribe to certain roles and responsibilities or descriptions of, of different things. And so, look, if you're someone who believes that um, to be male is to be very masculine and assertive and dominant, um, as opposed to feminine, which might mean being compassionate and caring and nurturing, all of a sudden you start to see how that aligns with how you might think about people and the jobs that they undertake. So you think about the number of men who go into something like nursing, okay, fairly small number um, with that traditional stereotype of, of being quite masculine. Um, same with females, you know, if females are stepping into a male domain, is it difficult to picture them because of that ascribed meaning or language to, to how you see uh, the feminine? So it's just starting to reflect on, you know, how we actually use this language. If you are um, from one of the Aboriginal tribes up in Cape York Peninsula, um, you may actually be very specific in how you describe your relationship with the land. And if you were to run into someone on the street and um, using that relationship to describe, um, you know, how to get somewhere, um, using that language of direction, you might say, um, give the direction according to where true north lies so you are always navigating with regard to where true north is and your place in space um is has nothing to do with um sort of you know go go forward take the, the second second left um and go up 200 meters and, and you're at your destination they are always utilizing um true north and landscape to navigate themselves and you can see how that starts to affect how people see themselves and they see uh, the environment around them so uh, the priorities around um, utilizing the land prioritizing the land managing the land and how that can have such an impact um, through their language um, and the way that people actually see the world and relate to the world around them Another quick example, how words have a profound impact. Um, now, this woman, Josephine Lee, discovered the transformative power of changing just one word um, when addressing juvenile offenders in the prison system. So she was having particular trouble with, with one young guy who basically wouldn't engage. He um, he was very standoffish, um, had a lot of trouble sort of even, these were this was through psychology, so she was there to assist in a psychological sense and um, he just really wouldn't engage in any conversation. She found that there was an immediate response when she actually started referring to this group of young guys as gentlemen. And what's really fascinating is the word gentlemen um, and the connotation of that expecting a sort of behaviour from, from someone. Um, when you think about these are a group of young kids who essentially have been, you know, given up on. Society doesn't have a lot of time for them. They probably think their future's pretty bleak. Um, but in learning through one word to address them in a different fashion, um, it was absolutely incredible the sort of change that this had on the behaviour 
Um, and what was fascinating, you know, the story about this particular young guy was um, the story came out that he was actually really, really scared. He was about to be transferred to an adult prison. He was petrified about what might happen to him um, and that was causing a whole range of behaviours. Um, but, of course, the world opens up a little bit differently when we start to expect a little bit more uh, and use appropriate language in that way. So I want to shift our perspective now to umpiring. That's why we're here. We want to talk about, you know, the message and languaging uh, around umpiring and, and the sorts of impacts that we can have in building the right kind of relationships in particularly relating to retention strategies and making sure that we're attracting diverse range of people into our groups. And the point I want to make around the legacy of our words um, comes down to that, you know, that initial Phil Jackson sort of story that I shared. Um, we can all relate to a Phil Jackson in our lives, or I hope that we can. You know, there's been a mentor or a coach, or maybe we've been the one to provide that kind of guidance to someone. And the language and communication that we use with that person or with that group of people can be the magic key that really unlocks that experience. Um, and it can really help that person to define themselves and, and find the confidence to, to break down some barriers um, to, for personal growth, um, to really work through any sort of discomfort for that personal evolution. And so, you know, words can be really, really powerful. Think about the impact of, of self-talk as another one, you know, umpiring in particular. The importance of self-talk just cannot be underestimated. Um, you know, how we are relating to ourselves to get the best out of ourselves, um, to respond to what might be pretty critical feedback at times and, and be able to push through and get the best out of ourselves. So, you know, words have a really big impact in that respect. When we look at the, the broader implication of, of the legacy of our words, um, we're able to really influence how the group sees us. You know, it signals a commitment to everyone if we're using the kind of language that um, helps to build positive relationships um, and is inclusive and it does respect everybody within the group. Um, and, of course, that's when you get to language as a tool for inclusion, recruitment and retention, which is the ultimate goal. So when we're talking about inclusive language, I think the main, the main point to remember is there are three key pillars. And it's asking the questions around the language that we're using when we're addressing people. Firstly, is it respectful? Um, secondly, is it accurate? Is it actually true and relevant? Um, and that brings me to the third point of relevance. Um, you know, to say, you know, let's just say someone uh, uses a wheelchair. Um, that may be relevant um, to refer to them as using a wheelchair, um, if you're looking at particular facilities or enabling them to participate in a group session and then having to alter those facilities. There may be another um, situation where that fact is actually totally irrelevant to the job being done um, and it's much more relevant to refer to someone by their name um, rather than the fact that they're in a wheelchair. So that's just using a very practical example but we'll go through some more examples a little later. I just wanted to point out these three key pillars that really come down to a lot of best practice when it comes to use of inclusive language across a variety of industries. And when we think about why inclusive language matters, it's really important to really regard um, the makeup of our country um, and our state and, and the sorts of people that we're coming into contact with um, and remembering that, you know, we're we're engaging with people who come from 200 different countries. They speak more than 200 different languages at home. Um, in fact, one in four of us was actually born overseas. Um, we have got a myriad of different Indigenous languages um, and people from the Indigenous population, many of whom have a really beautiful uh, relationship with the game of Australian football, and yet very few of them actually come to umpiring. So I think we need to, we just need to start to look at that and go, well, what sort of things can we start to do differently to engage them and, and bring them along for the ride? Um, you know, the millions of people who are hearing impaired and have to navigate their daily lives um, without that sense um, is, is quite astounding when you look at the numbers. Um, disability, you know, we often talk about the number of umpires who uh, do have autism, for example. Um, how do we make sure we are being engaging um, with, with people who are in our group who are navigating that? 
uh, and making sure that they're participating and, and they're participating to their full potential. And sometimes it can be a really small thing that has a significant impact um, on that person's experience. Let's not forget that half the population are women and girls. So again, it's about asking, you know, are there missed opportunities um, because of the kind of language that we're using? Um, are we aware of the impact of that language? And it's really important to think about, look, a word might seem like nothing. And when I'm talking about inclusive language, you know, I'm not talking about, look, once something was said and it, and it occurred that one time and, you know, and that's going to affect someone's whole experience. It's not about that at all. And it's certainly not about, um, you know, jokes are off limits, you're not allowed to have fun anymore, you know, training is a very serious space. Nothing like that. All I'm saying is for people in the minority, um, it's the accumulated effects of, of language that actually in a lot of ways makes them feel excluded or invisible. Uh, and that can actually paint a really significant picture for them, whether they feel valued or part of the team. And so it's really learning to understand, look, if I'm in their shoes, how am I feeling about the language that's being used? So when we talk about legacy of language, ultimately it comes down to helping individuals to belong to the group, making sure that everyone in the team actually feels valued um, and recognised uh, as, as being part of the team. It comes down to positive coaching relationships and outcomes. Um, you know, we've all been in situations where we're getting or giving coaching feedback. Um, at the end of the day, the way in which that feedback is given is going to be really significant. And so it's just being aware of, of the words, words we're using in developing those relationships. Um, word of mouth uh, starts to be a real factor around people's experience. So if someone comes into your group and they have a fantastic experience where they feel really welcome and part of it um, and the language that's used just is, is welcoming, then, you know, they're going to be spreading the message and spreading that word. Alternatively, they have a negative experience. That word of mouth isn't going to be so great for umpiring. It's not going to be so great for your group. And it just makes that whole recruitment piece just a lot harder. So collectively, when we start to see the impact on brand, reputation, how the public um, or clubs might see your group, um, you start to see the flow on effects of inclusive language. I'm going to share a very specific practical example in a moment, but I just wanted to touch on the, uh, the research that was recently delivered by Dr Victoria Rawlings from the University of Sydney. Now, she did a targeted research survey around female participation and retention in umpiring, which is just fantastic. It's given us a lot of insights um, into what it's like for um, a minority group in umpiring. And she focused on three main things in relation to language. And that is, first of all, it's a key factor in culture building. So it's understanding while those in the majority may feel that certain words hold little or no power, those on the margins may experience them a bit differently. And so it's just understanding that not everyone is going to have the same experience of words and language, and it's just being alert to that. In umpiring, this is particularly relevant for girls and women uh, because they're either the only girl or, or woman in the group, uh, or, you know, they may be one of very few. So I believe the name's been changed just to protect the identity of the, of the survey respondent, but this was a, a response from uh, one of the questions that Victoria asked the, the survey participants. Um, and it was just sharing a story around this particular umpire who thought she would use COVID lockdown as an opportunity to engage in some psychological uh, help through the umpiring, what she called them the umpiring shrink, but essentially the psychologist available to the group. Um, she really wanted to get his perspective and talk through some things that had been affecting her and her umpiring and, um, you know, potentially affecting whether or not she was, was going to come back um, to the group and, and continue on with umpiring. So she explains that she, she reaches out um, and there was an email that the group had received from the psychologist. And she says this email literally from the sports shrink and she shares her screen with Victoria and she explains this is the cut and paste and it refers to the group as gents. See this middle here? Right. So she says, from the sports shrink to all of us on the list, look at this. So it's like the email from him when I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should talk to them about this. Um, it's like, hi, gents. And I'm like, well, that's not safe for me to talk about um, some of those gender-related issues. Um, you know, someone she wanted to go to as a trusted person um, about 
why she might not come back next season. Um, she acknowledges the fact that it's just a word. Um, it's just a sticker. Uh, and I get there's only two females on the list, 99% are gents. But, you know, if you put yourself in her shoes, in Maha's shoes, um, and have a think about whether that's going to be the sort of thing that's going to encourage you to, to seek out help and support from someone or to just say, look, stuff it, I'm invisible. <laughs> here I have, you know, being part of a message here that just doesn't even recognise that I exist. And so, again, you know, here we have a, a female who she's not interested in making a big deal out of this. She acknowledges that it might seem like a minor thing, but at the end of the day, it does have an impact on her experience. I want to spend just a little bit of time now, um, discussion time, just to ask you all uh, about some tips for building an inclusive language culture. Um, and I've got some principles that I'm going to share after this discussion, but I'm really keen for, for your insights because you're the ones that are out there uh, on the ground, uh, practically involved with umpiring groups. And it's really important that we lead from the front when we're talking about things like inclusion. Um, and uh, as I explained early on in the workshop series, you know, this material that we're building out here is going to eventually sit on an online portal. It's going to be accessed by all of the umpire coaches uh, and staff members um, involved with umpiring, not only through the state, but through the nation. So we really want to get this right and I really value your input. So um, let's just open up the floor and um, I'd love to really hear any thoughts that you might have uh, around this idea of inclusive language or even reflections on, on what you've heard so far. Feel free to jump in. I'll go, Chelsea. It's Jock. Hey, Jock. Um, obviously, inclusion is important to me personally, but um, I find it best to listen to the coaches deliver their chats and have a discussion with them afterwards about some of the language they use. It's very easy for us to refer to he and his and blokes and all that sort of stuff because that's what we've grown up with. Mm. And there's no doubt that I do the same from time to time, but I think it, you've got to make a real deliberate effort to just, you know, if you're going to say he, say she. If you're going to say them, you know, use the word them and thus they or use the word field umpire, boundary umpire, goal umpire, which captures everybody. I was at a session last week and I noticed the coach was saying this stuff and, and I just said to him at the end, just be mindful, you know, there, there were about five women in the room, um, but every time you said something, it was probably directed at the, the guys in the room, well, that's what it felt like. And then interestingly enough, we had a, an old-timer retiring and uh, he gave his, you know, his life history, which was great, and but then he directly spoke to the audience and said, you know, if you blokes want to make it higher, you know, you need to do this, this and this. So this is the generation gap there as well. Um, but I think you've got to make a deliberate effort to be mindful of what you're saying and eventually it'll come a bit more natural to you. Um, but I wouldn't be stressed personally, you know, if, you, if you're reflecting and think, gee, I said all that, I'm doing this because that's how you learn from it and that's how you keep moving with it. So that was just an experience last week, but obviously through my my life, I look for that inclusive language anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, um, you know, you sort of use, you said then don't be stressed. I think the other thing is like don't be stressed about getting things right or wrong. I think sometimes um, we live in a world where we're expected to be so PC and politically correct. It can be almost paralyzing, like thinking I'm afraid of offending or I'm afraid of doing the wrong thing and then nothing changes. Um, whereas, you know, we know that there are positive impacts from, you know, just even trying, <laughs> even just, you know, going, hey, you know, we're, we're not perfect, no one's perfect, um, but to try to include people more, um, it actually says a lot to that person um, in, in terms of being considered a part of the group, um, you know, and if they end up being on the cusp, that can be the difference between, you know, staying or going. So, um, no, I appreciate you jumping in there. Do people want to put their um, put their videos on? Do Just you mind? Just your screen, Charles. Don't share it? No, un unshare. How do I? Okay. You're talking me through the tech here. I'll unshare for the time being. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really weird today. I can't, how do I unshare? It won't actually let me. 
unshare. I'll just stop share. Uh, yeah, I can't find I've, it. Yeah, I've got it. I've got everyone on my screen. So, so is that fine? Yep, I can see. Oh, you... okay. Well, no, I, I just kept it the same. I just changed, yeah, screens. It's nice to see faces, then I don't feel like I'm talking to nothing. Um, did anyone just have any, you know, brief comments they wanted to to add around inclusive language? Because I'm just really conscious. I don't want this stuff to become like um, jargon, or you know, often we hear about inclusion, diversity, and things like that. And I just think it's really important we make sure it's practical and it's it's used as a tool to to lead to the outcomes we're looking for. Um, so any reflections on inclusive language? Chelsea, it's Sharon. Hi, hey, Sharon. <clears throat> we was only having a conversation with my chairman today, and part of, I think, one of the issues we have is that just the diverse age. Like we have, you know, we've got goal umpires that are 65 to 70 that are totally different when they walk into a room to when you have the young boundary kids. Mm. And we were just talking about the fact that a couple of them will always walk in and come up and give me a kiss and a hug. And we're trying to stop it because it's like, you can't do that to the young girls. Like they mean nothing in it. They mean nothing wrong. It's just being friendly. But it's just, we're working with such different age diversity in our groups. Yeah. And I think it's something that um, it's, it's great. And I think Jock sort of touched on in terms of how he's you know leading from the top for example and setting a really good example and if the coaches are sort of you know not being so mindful then they can have a little you know chat to the side and just make sure they are being mindful and i think setting the example is really important um and i think it can be a really awkward conversation can't it to have yeah um, particularly with an older gent who is the loveliest person and you're like well i personally don't mind it um but it might not be so kosher um and, and maybe it is something just as a, you know, taking the group aside, um, you know, not having to single anyone out or anything and just saying, look, hey, you know, hey, fellas, we're just being really aware um, and um, conscious of making sure we're, we're welcoming people in the right way and we're, mm. we're behaving in the sorts of ways that are appropriate for a professional um, environment. And I know that sounds a bit, you know, professional environment, but that – umpiring is you know we're all there sort of doing a job and and the expectation is professionalism and so yeah I think and also it's not about going sort of policing it in the sense of you can do this and you can't do that but I think at least having that that sort of side conversation going well where it's something that you know it's important we take seriously as a group um and just to be mindful and so kind of I don't want to sound like I'm going softly, softly, but you can still, I think, introduce it in a really respectful way. We're working on that at the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a hard one. Mm, it is. Um, I mean, it happens with me at AFL. Some of the guys come in and because we shake hands at games and some of them, like, give you a big a hug and a kiss. And I don't, I mean, I don't really care. But then you get some sideways glasses and then <laughs> you're like, God, um, Everyone has different ideas around what things mean, don't they? And and that's one of the issues. Um, some of the girls can take it the wrong way, so we have to be very careful. Yes. And I think what you've actually just said, I mean, saying exactly that um, is just a, a really important point as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, for people to hear that message and go, well, it might be taken the wrong way. Be careful. Well, and they mean no harm. It's just yeah. a an age thing and it's just something that we have to deal with with uh with our age groups going from you know 12 to 70 we yeah. just have to deal with all the different levels yep that's it mm. yeah chelsea I've, I've got it i actually got pulled up on this sort of stuff earlier this year with one of the one of the laws videos i did obviously the the laws video was based on afl men's matches because that's where they were that's where the AFL were getting their their vision, their data from, because AFLW weren't using the new rules. Mm. So in my videos, I was referring to he and him and his because they're all males playing. And I actually got pulled up by someone who said, just beware when you're talking to a group. Uh, yeah, Jock, you were one. And also um, someone from Riddle pulled me up and said, when, when you're talking to a group, make sure that you're using neutral pronouns. Um, so I think it's really important to to be aware of it, but also it, it's still okay to to use those specific pronouns when you're talking about specific people. 
yeah. and when it's a group, it's the it's that important group setting where you've got to be really wary of it. So I, I actually got pulled up myself this year, and I've tried to make sure I'm very conscious about using player or umpire or fieldy boundary goalie rather than him or her or whatnot. Yeah. No, really good one. And I think it's so um, – I mean, it's only been the last couple of years that even the rule book has incorporated him or her as a decision maker. So and I would still, often – And still it's holding the man as we discussed the other week. Well, well, yeah, and so many rules that are just traditionally, yep, that's how we set it. Um, but even, you know, I'd, I'd check out a, a blue mooner. I'd be like, oh, what's this rule? And I'm like, oh, when he decides this. I'm like, oh, well, you know, okay, fine. <laughs> um, but it, And it never really – you know, it's not necessarily some something, and I often talk to Eleni about this, it's like, well, it's not going to, someone who is determined to succeed in an area and you're like, I want to be an umpire, I want to do it, it's probably not going to affect them so much. But I think what we need to think about at community level, um, often it is people who are on the cusp, they are either, they come to umpiring because it's maybe a little bit of a hobby or they're just dipping their toe in or they want to play an umpire and, um you go, well, if this, this is the reminder they're getting all the time, what kind of impact is it going to have? Um, yeah. Did it, anyone else, did either of the Michaels want to jump in? How are you guys? Good, thanks. Um, yeah, so on the weekend I was trying to create a um, poster for a female umpire recruitment driver with a grant we got, so... I was very mindful of what I actually put on in the text in that. I still haven't finished it because I've been fully really overthinking it a little bit, but just oh. not wanting to be too cheesy or, um, yeah. So definitely at the front of mind with that. Yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. noisy in the background around here, oh. so hopefully too many That's chatterbugs. Right. But yeah, so definitely it's one of those things. If you're going to put it out to the public, you've got to be mindful of what you're actually saying. Yeah. And sometimes it maybe just grab, like, if you're being mindful around gender language, for example, just grab a, grab a woman. <laughs> Get it, say, yeah. read this. Read this. Um, what are your thoughts? Have you got someone there who you can just give it to to well, flick yeah, it at me? Uh, wife, wife was in bed at the time, so, yeah. If, yeah, <laughs> well, something. that'd be helpful if, yeah, if I can flick it through to you and have a look at it. That'd be great. Yeah, if you want. If you think, I mean, look, I'm, I'm all for getting things done quickly. So, and if you feel yeah. like it's taking too long, then just, yeah, flick it through. I'm happy to give some feedback. I hope that uh, I do a good job, though, because there's always someone out there who wants to point it out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. How are you going out at Essendon, uh, Michael? How are things going? Settle down a little bit? Yeah, settle down a little bit, uh, thankfully, after the last few weeks. Yeah, no, it's starting to go a bit better. Um, so we've had a few problems with crowd behaviour and umpire abuse, but um, we're working through that. Um, so I actually umpired a couple of under-10s games on the weekend and uh, I felt like I was umpiring the AFL grand final. But uh, um, <laughs> Very was, important outcomes in those games. Yeah, I actually umpired with probably a 13 or 14-year-old girl who'd probably only done four or five games in her life. Um, and it was, for me, it was about how I was helping teach her as well like trying to teach her to umpire it was sort of she was quite very quiet for a start and um at, at half time in the first game i just said look do you have any questions and she was a bit nervous for a start but like after that she sort of after she asked one question she just had four or five questions and it was just she had these questions it was just finding a way that she was able to communicate them to me as well like she was too nervous to actually ask them for a start but after she'd asked one, the questions just kept coming. So it's just finding that language that works individually, even throughout. I coach our juniors, and it's sort of we've got such a broad range of umpires in the female ranks and the male ranks as well. So we had some who've probably been with us for three or four years, and they told me now that they don't feel comfortable training with some of the guys that are more experienced because they don't feel like they fit in with the running side. So they'd rather train with the first year. So it's just finding what works for the individual for us. Yeah, it's, um, it is, it's, it's relationship management and it's, and it's just being aware of how to, how to speak to people. <laughs> so you hit it on the head, you hit it on the head. We'll keep going. Cause I'm, I'm just aware of time unless anyone else really wanted to jump in with something. I might keep going. 
I'll just make sure that I've, uh, so this should work now. You got my screen again now, guys. Yep. So um, when we're talking about making sure we're building an inclusive language culture, these are just some pretty straightforward principles that I think are helpful. We don't want a list of 60 things to remember, but if we could remember five, um, you know, just think of the person first. So it doesn't have to be, oh, oh, how am I saying this? It's like, well, just call them by their name. <laughs> or if it is a he or a she, that's okay. Um, or if you don't know, ask. Um, if, you're, if you're referring to um, people in groups, so just say, hey, everyone. So instead of going, oh, hey, boys, or hey, you know, I don't mind, guys. I don't have a personal problem because I think that just refers to everyone. But if you're concerned and you're not sure, just the group is folks or friends or, you know, just use a, a very general term. Um, I said before, if you're in doubt about something, ask. So it might be, look, you might, it might be someone's gender identity. Um, and I know that can be very, that could be a tricky thing, but um, that's where, you know, referring to someone by name can be very helpful. Um, but if there is sort of an issue where you can have a, a side conversation and just say, look, I, you know, I need to know how you would like me to refer to you. Um, obviously, it's got to be appropriate to ask that question. But, um you know, it's much better to ask someone and to show the respect uh, around any uncertainty than to just uh, ignore them or um, or just, you know, go ahead and, and say the wrong thing that's quite offensive. But um, same with a lot of cultural things. Um, so it might be someone's culture, where they're from or their ethnic background or something, and you might be unsure. So instead of just sort of, you know, making an assumption, just, just ask the person. And I'm sure that they will actually be really um, grateful for that and, and the, the fact that they're being respected. Um, so also, it's just bearing in mind, these are about relationships. It's language that identifies people's strengths. So um, rather than, you know, being derogatory. So you would be aware that things like ADD, schizo on the spectrum, we kind of say, we can say things like that, thinking that we're just, um, you know, being very casual with our language, but they actually are real diagnoses. So it's just something to really bear in mind when we're, when we're talking to people. Um, so when we start looking at, all right, what's the difference um, between being inclusive and not so inclusive? Well, instead of saying, hey, hey, boys, just say, hey, everyone. Um, instead of saying something like, you know, someone is confined to a wheelchair, that's it's making a bit of a judgment call by the use of the word confined. So you could just say they use a wheelchair. That's a fact. And, you know, if it's relevant to the conversation that you say they use a wheelchair and therefore we need to have a ramp available so that they can access coaching, something like that. So it's, it's relevant to the way the activity is being um, designed so that person can participate. Same with, you know, they suffer from Down syndrome or autism. Um, just say, look, they were born with Down syndrome or they were born with autism, so we need to make sure that we're very clear in our instructions and in how we're going to map out the session. Um, again, it's all about just embracing that, uh, that person and, and ensuring that they are participating um, and just being aware of the, the language around that. Um, and, of course, things like, you know, you're playing like a girl, um, not so great if you've got girls in the group and you're using that as a derogatory term you know, not very nice. <laughs> so, um, you know, think about how those people would feel and just and just use an alternative. So back to basics, is it respectful? Is it accurate? And is it relevant? Um, that's basically what it comes down to. And I think that is the end. Um, so look, thanks everyone for jumping on and being part of that little micro workshop. I don't know why I can't stop sharing this, Andrew. This whole system today has not been my friend. Something's changed. But um, I'll um, just let it go and hand over, and handball over to you. Yeah, it's not showing with me anymore. So I think it's worked okay. Yeah, I got off the screen and then um, anyway, we can work through those details separately. These guys don't need to hear about it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thanks good. very much, Charles. Uh, before we wrap up, any other pressing questions, queries, concerns um, after the last couple of months? No, uh, I did. I just forgot to mention at the start. So um, just to give everyone a bit of heads up. So AFL Vic have asked me to um, start doing some analysis on numbers currently and then also work towards doing some future umpiring projections. So um, they've already started to ask me to pass on some data analysis onto CEOs and regional managers and whatnot. So um, that'll be sent through to them. It's not um, being used as an accountability against 
anyone or anything. It's simply just a, um, there's a there's an internal independent review going on in AFL Vic, read, led by Jeff Walsh, um, and he wants a whole bunch of data and information from from a whole range of people. So um, I've started to collate all that, um, and I'm when I, when I'm told to send it through, I'm sending it through. So. Um, when I start to finalise some more things, I will pass it on. So the data I've sent through is very broad and just very initial. Um, and then if I've got anything more finite, I'll start to share it with you guys. Um, there's no point giving you data that's not 100% correct when you already sort of know where your numbers and whatnot are at. So I'm just sort of giving broad broad understanding or broad information about some particular particular issues in terms of registration numbers or gaps in participation rates and whatnot. Um, but it's got nothing to do with your own personal performance or strategies or whatnot. It's just simply an, an analysis for a re review that we're doing behind the scenes. Um, but if anything comes up, and you've got any questions about it, feel free to holler. Um, not trying to hide anything, more than happy to chat it through if you need to or if you want. Other than that, um, thanks very much for tuning in. Again, if anything pops up between now and our next workshop, let me know. I'm happy to help. I am slowly getting around to all the groups. I think I've been to seven umpire clubs now, um, and I'm starting to head into regional areas. So, Buckets, I will be coming out your way soon. I will be coming up there. So, uh, get ready for a, for a visit. I'll take you to Corio when it's three degrees. You love it. I'm um, just waiting for it. That's what I'm waiting. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and good luck for the weekends coming up. Catch you all soon. Hello. See you, mate. See ya. Thanks for that. Thanks, Sharon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Charles. Actually, I might grab you briefly, Tabo. Well, well, it's just us two it's now. Just us. We'll, I'll stop, stop recording, recording though. Yeah.